start our recording so I don't forget. So today we're going to keep going where he left off since no one has questions. Because it was true that no one has questions on the patterns, then the patterns will be due next class. So when I see you on Tuesday, the patterns will be due. The fact that it's due doesn't mean that that's the last day to turn it in. If you turn it in late, that is much better than never. But if you look at the grading scheme over at the achievements, if you turn in too many things late, then that has a chance of penalizing your grade. I don't want to take a big tangent on how grading works right now. But if you haven't done patterns, try and get it done over the weekend. Uh, a reminder that you can always do homework in groups. So at the end of this class, in my after class email, I'm going to say if anyone wants to share either phone numbers for texting or phone numbers for phoning or email with each other, let me know. And then I will send out another email saying these are the people that want to do that. Because just like it's easier to get up and go jogging in the morning if you have a partner who will be disappointed if you're not there, it's often good to do math and it might be easier if you're whatever. Thursday night, I'm going to do some math, and I know that so-and-so, my classmate, is by his or her phone, and we can call each other when we get stuck, and maybe that'll make it happen better. So look for that in the email after class, so do you want to share things or not? And if you have lots of jobs and kids and no free time, that's okay. You don't have to share your phone number or email with people. Okay, calories. We had two topics. Oops, I'm not sharing my screen as I go. Okay, so now that you're looking at my screen, uh, where did my view of everyone go? One moment, Zoom issue. I got a second monitor so I can see everyone's wonderful faces. Okay, so that was the patterns. The what is math and making patterns from tables. Calories has two sections. Calories and exercise we did. Calories and food is where we left off. So we talked about this part. Carbs and protein have four calories for each gram. Fat has nine. And we did some example problems with that. The calories in a day we skipped, so let's go to that. The USDA has recommendations that someone on a 2,000 calorie a day diet should be eating this stuff. And again, this is a math class, so maybe some of you are fitness experts and know a lot more about um, eating healthy than the general USDA guidelines, but we're gonna pretend these are good numbers to use. So if you were eating this many calories a day, they recommend divvying it up this way. One thing to ask is what percent of the whole are these sections? And there's this thing we do, percent of the whole formula, where to find the percentage of a number, you do the part divided by the whole. That makes an answer in decimal format. And we don't want a decimal, we want a percent. So we have to go back on how to do decimal to percent format. So I want to do some review of that. I put a little bit of review here in the math 25 notes, but let's pretend that we want more than that. So, oops, anything urgent there? Uh, okay, someone's stuck. We'll worry about that later. Okay, so let's talk about percents. If you were in my Math 20 class recently, then this will be a potentially boring review. If not, maybe seeing it a different way will help. So we could rate things on a scale of one to five. So call or type in chat, then how much do you like jogging, banana runs, and elevator music on a scale of one to five? Uh, and if Baron is talking, he's still muted. I can't hear him. I just see his mouth moving. Sorry, asking children to be quiet. Ah, uh, okay, no problem. Everyone's still before breakfast and not participating. Give me some numbers, doesn't matter. I want to put things here on the board. Drugging, banana runs. What? Can you repeat your question? Sure, on a scale of one to five, how much do you like jogging? Three. 
you too. Oops, wait a minute. I am forgetting I can't write on my board. I am not at LCC. Okay, now I can write on my board. So I hear a two or a three banana runts. Five. Five. I put that one on because everyone one. either loves them or can't stand them. Elevator music. Four. Four, okay. So in English, we don't have any real word for how to rate things on a scale of one to five. If we were to say, how much do you like jogging on a scale of one to 100, then what would someone say? 56. Six only, okay. So on a scale of one to 100, there used to be a word and it would be out of 100. So per would be out of and cent would be 100, like per cent. So since English is a sloppy language, the two words per cent got squished together and now we just say percent to mean out of 100. In math, we have different ways to do out of 100. By the way, did I share in the last class how you can be looking at this Jamboard whether or not I am? Yes. Yes, okay. That, the link at the top of, in case you weren't here before. If you go to our main math website, then if you click on this jam one link, you can see what I'm looking at, even if I'm not sharing the screen. And if you want, <laughs> I can give you permission to draw on it if you want to add to it. Okay, so in math, we could do divided by 100. So if I had say 38%, I could write that as 38 divided by 100. There's two decimal point scoots to the left. That's the same as divided by 100. A little bit divided by. So I could say 38, you know, jump like that. We could write it as a fraction with denominator 100. Or we could write it as the number itself and then times one over 100. So whenever I play with fractions, my goal is to look at these four things and see which is the easiest one to do, since I'm lazy and don't want to do extra work. So back to where we were. If I want to take a number and make a percentage of it, so what percentage of our calories, according to this USDA stuff, are from carbs, then I can do that. So my percent is part divided by whole. So 300 is, no, not 300. The, the 1,200, I have to measure the same thing. They have to be calories and calories. Do the division. So I have this decimal and I want to make it a percent. So which of my four things will be the simplest way to turn a decimal into a percent? Times it by 100. It'll be six uh, percent. I hear someone quietly. Speak louder, Elizabeth. It would be 6% or you times it by 100. I just want to take the 0.6 and make it a percent. Okay, yeah, times it by 100. To make yeah, you know, times it by 100. Divided by 100 was to go out of percent. I want to go into percent. I have to go the other direction. The easiest thing to do the other direction is the decimal points. Yeah, it would be 6%. Or 60 a minute, sorry. Okay, let's go back to our 
review lecture and do this a little more carefully. We can skip that for now. So if I wanted to write a percent as a decimal. Yeah. Oh yeah, 6% would be zero point, uh, point yeah. zero 0.06 or something like that. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. So. I had 47.1%. To get out of percent, the easy thing to do was to say this percent symbol is the same thing as two decimal point scoots to the left. Maybe I should even write it more clearly that if I want to get rid of the percent symbol, I have to replace it with something that means the same thing. And of those four things that meant the same thing, the simplest one is the two decimal point scoots. So to get out of percent format, we did two scoots to the left. If I want the opposite problem, Now I have a plain decimal I want to go into percent format, so I have to do the opposite. If I'm just going to stick a percent symbol on, that changes the number. To be fair, I have to also do the opposite. So the opposite of two scoots to the left was two scoots to the right. I get my answer that way. So the summary of these past two slides to get out of percent, you go twice to the left. To go into percent, you go twice to the right, is this thing we nickname Riplop. So right into percent, left out of percent. And the acronym doesn't say twice, but we know it's always two scoots because it's percent and it's out of 100 and 100 always has two zeros. So we're always scooting twice. So when in our actual Math 25 lecture, it talks about Riplop, right into percent, left out of percent. That's what it's talking about. If you had Math 20 at LCC, hopefully your teacher used that acronym and this is familiar to you. If they didn't, then oh well, they were supposed to. Or maybe not, but they should anyway. Okay, now we can do an interesting problem. So Odette has a 2,000 calorie per day diet. She eats 13 grams of fat. And we wonder what percent of her recommended daily fat has she eaten? I have to go back and see what the recommendation was. I want to twist it. I want to. Here. Okay, so the recommendation is 585. Oh, that's calories. I'm reading the wrong number, 65 grams. So 
So I want to do my problem. Just like before, I'm going to do my percent is a part divided by whole. And when I get a decimal, I have to rip -lop it. Which of these is the part and which is the whole? Part is the 13. Yeah. So this time it's really easy to see which is the part and which is the whole. This is the whole day. That's just part of the day. Be careful not to get into the trap to thinking the small number is always the part. That's not always true. If you are, say, investing money, then the baseline amount that you started with, that's what counts as the whole. And if your amount of investment grows before you retire, then that's bigger. So we'll see lots of cases later on in the term where the part might be bigger than the whole. So the whole is your original, your baseline, what we're comparing things to. And we'll start rephrasing this in those ways. But for now, this is nice and straightforward. Okay, what is 13 divided by 65? Zero point two. So I'm going into percent, so I go to the right. And get twenty percent. Okay, questions on any of that? Everyone's fine. You're very quiet. Okay. Should we get my books? Are they stuck? Yeah. No. Okay. <clears throat> There's a second bit that doesn't appear on boxes of food as much about if you were eating 2,500 calories a day. The numbers get a little bigger. And as one example, Arthur is right in between. So we should kind of average his things. Everyone remember average of add them up and divide by how many? If not, we'll do lots of averaging later. How many number of numbers there are? Yeah, in this case, just two. We could take the 2,000 and the 2,500 and add them up and divide by two and get the average for each category. That's just sort of a brain warm up for averages. We'll do more later. Okay, if you were in a traditional classroom and all being chatty, I would break you up into groups of students and you could plan out food and do some food analysis, but we're not gonna do that right now during lecture. And you don't have your factfulness book, so we can't do that. Okay, a logical thing to think now is, well, should I eat 2000 calories a day? Should I eat 2500? Who knows? So we're gonna talk about metabolism, our next topic. The easiest formulas for metabolism are the heart rate formulas. As you get older, your maximum safe heart rate decreases. The old guideline was 220 minus your age, which is easy, but not very accurate. So some researchers have done a better analysis and the better formula is 221 minus 64% of your age. So we've done Riplop and changed the 64% to 0.64. If you click on here, you can actually read the research paper that was happening, but that's okay. If you're doing aerobic exercise, remember from last class, that's when the more you exercise, the more oxygen you need. Then you want to have it be at least half that, so 0.5 for 50%, but not more than 85% because if you get up to your maximum heart rate, then you're stressing your body a bit too much. So let's do an example of that. That's gonna be hard to read. I am going to see if I do that. Grab it 
it that way. And then maybe when I paste it, it's not so thin. Is that legible to everybody? Yeah, you can see it. Okay. Yes. Okay, so all we know is his age, and that's all we need. And later on, I'm going to confuse you, since I am a terrible person, and we're going to start describing our people with their age, and their height and their weight and all of these different formulas will start coming together and you will have to pay attention that for this formula all i care about is his age so his maximum will be 211 minus 0.64 times 35. over here i had parentheses here i left them out am i in trouble Yeah, because you didn't write it like you're supposed to. You're very quiet, Elizabeth. I can't hear you. Because you're you didn't write it like you're supposed to. I don't know. I didn't, yes. What's going to happen with order of operations? Am I going to multiply or subtract first? Multiply. Multiply. If I plug all of this at once in my calculator, it will be okay. So these parentheses are just cosmetic. They're there to help my eye read the formula to say, oh yes, this is 64% of his age. That's why that is over there. It's a little harder to read this way, but as far as the calculator cares, they're exactly the same. It's going to multiply first, whether or not you write the parentheses. Okay, so 211 minus 0.64 times 35. So I'm getting 188.6. I'm not going to write 188.6. I'm just going to write about 189. These medical formulas are never precise to within a tenth of a heartbeat, right? So. So his lower limit, we're going to take the 189, multiply it by 0.5. get about 94. 95. And then the upper limit, we would take the 189, multiply it by 0.85, wish these dots were a little bigger. about 161. Okay, not bad. We're just multiplying by different things. Questions about any of that? So David, it's really important that we write the beats per minute part? Or uh, you should get in the habit of labeling your answer. Yes, Crystal, you're at the right place. Yeah, it's a word problem. I should label it something. I don't think BPM really is a very standard thing that anyone would recognize, but I have checked off my to-do box. I've labeled my answer good enough. Thanks. Okay, so that's kind of the easy formulas, break us into formulas, plug things in. Not terribly interesting though. This one actually is interesting. Let me get bigger. So what's the basal metabolic rate? BMR actually is an acronym. You can search for this on Google. Everyone knows what BMR is. Earlier we noted that our body uses energy even when resting breathing, circulating blood, body temperature, digesting, all of that. So all of that is called basal 
the word is like baseline. And so BMR stands for basal metabolic rate or baseline metabolic rate. And everyone says BMR because it's easy to say. So if you were lying in a hospital bed all day and not moving, your BMR is how many calories you would burn. If you ate more than that, you would have too many calories, excess energy, and you'd gain weight. If you ate less than that, then you would not have enough calories for your metabolism and you would lose weight. So we can't measure it in class, but we can estimate it with formulas. And that name, the basal metabolic rate, was invented in 1918 by two famous scientists. And they discovered that it could be predicted quite accurately if you measure the surface area of someone's skin. So imagine going into the doctor's office and they have all these little sticky things and they put stickers all over your body and count how many stickers it takes to cover your skin. And then ta-da, they can figure out your basal metabolic rate. And that would be really annoying. So they kept experimenting, kept measuring things. They were looking for a pattern. Remember yesterday, not yesterday, last class, Tuesday, all of these patterns come from formulas. And they actually did find a formula. They could estimate someone's BMR based on their weight and height and age and sex. So that's a lot better than having to cover someone with little stickers when you go to the doctor's office. And for more than 60 years, their formula, their pattern was the one that we used. But in 1990, now there's a better formula. Mifflin and St. Jor found a better way to take those four things, weight, height, age, and sex, and put them into formulas for the BMR. So here we go. There's two formulas, one if you're a woman, one if you're a man. You take your weight, your height, and your age, and you plug them in. It looks very much the same, except that the women get plus five at the end, the men get minus 161. And then you can find someone's BMR. A couple notes. One, these are the US versions. So pounds and inches. If we had the metric version, then the numbers here and here would be different to go with kilograms and centimeters. Another comment, just like before, the parentheses are cosmetic. We're gonna multiply the weight and the 4.55. We're going to multiply the height and the 15.88. We're going to multiply the age and the five before we do the plus and the minus that's separating those terms. So these parentheses are here to make it readable you can leave them out when you're using your calculator. So here's two, I'll do one, you do the other. I'll go first. Okay, so first thing, Arthur's a guy, we're gonna use the bottom formula. His weight is 150. His height is five foot eight. I need to make it only inches. So five foot eight, the five feet, five times 12 is 60 inches just from the five feet. And then we have the plus eight inches and we get to 68 inches. That sometimes confuses people. Everyone okay on how to change five foot eight into just 60 inch, 68 inches? Holler and type in chat yeah, if you want me to explain that more. I don't get it. You don't get it, okay. So every inch, I'm sorry, every foot 
is 12 inches. So his five feet makes five twelves happen. And five times 12 is 60. So just the five feet part, let me see how I can write this better. is the 60 inches. But the eight inches are still there because he's not five foot tall. If he was exactly five foot tall, that would be the 60 inches. He has eight inches more, so we have to add those on also, and then we get to 68. Did that clarify? Yes, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. So, I have to change that, that's my trap. That's the only thing that's really hard about this because everything else, the calculator does all the work. Then his age is 35. Oops, and I made a mistake, that's a minus. Does it make sense that that one's a minus, that the older you are, the slower your metabolism goes? Yes. So, two things about how I wrote this. First, I did my best, and on the silly whiteboard it's a little hard, but I want to make my multiplication dots centered and bigger than my decimal dots, so that it's always clear when I am multiplying and when this is just a decimal. I don't want to do 68 times 15 times 88. That would, of course, be wrong. This is 15.88. The second thing, I took out the parentheses but I did try and leave space around the pluses and minuses. That helps my eyes visually group things as, ah, oh, this is the weight part, this is the height part, this is the age part, this is the number at the end. So by leaving space around the pluses and around the minuses, then my eye is still happy, even though the parentheses are gone. So two good habits to get into when you write it. Okay, you don't have to write what I just did, but I encourage you to, partly because of the 68 baloney, that can be tricky, and partly just because everyone with math is slightly dyslexic and switches numbers around and things like that. So write it out neatly, even though you could just plug everything in. But once it's there, now the calculator is earning its pay. I just have to type it all in the calculator. And if I didn't hit anything wrong, I'm getting about 1,426 calories per day. For calories, I'm never going to worry about tenths of a calorie. Things are not that accurate. Everyone happy with that one? If your calculator doesn't get the same answer, holler because you're about to do one, so. Yeah, let's do the fancy thing with I can't do a thumbs up. Okay, if you get this, do your little thumbs up from the uh, reactions at the bottom. Not the raise hand and the participants, but there's a thumbs up. So Timothy, Cade, good, good. Yeah. I know, I'm really measuring if you can find the thumbs up button. But Don Elizabeth Bryan, everyone okay? We're gonna... Okay, at the bottom there's reactions and there's a thumbs up there. Yeah, I got a different Ah, uh, okay. Um, use chat or holler if you need me to. Okay, so if you had gone to the top of things and opened 
or Jamboard on your own, then you would have the ability now to be in control and see whether you're looking at my example problem or the blank one for you to do. If you didn't do that, then you're out of luck. Rely on your written notes or something. But your turn to do 24. I will do it in a moment. But make sure you can do it without me before we go on. If someone wants, they're welcome to write on the Jamboard here. You could do that through the Zoom annotations, or I could just share writing ability with you. Anyone want to do something on the board? I know you don't have the fancy pen thing, so. Okay, grade my penmanship. Did I do a good job of putting spaces around my terms so that you can see the weight area, the height area, the age area, and the number at the end? Can you tell my multiplication dots from my decimal dots? So hopefully I did okay, hopefully you did too. Okay, whatever this is, 110 times 4.5. So about 1444. Everyone get that? Okay, so his is a little lower. Hers is a little higher. But pretty close. These numbers are much smaller than the 2000 calories per day we saw with the USDA guidelines. So why are these numbers smaller? Who remembers what this is? Because this is if she just laid in bed all day. Right, these are like ultimate couch potato people. Right? They're not even getting up to use the bathroom, which is gross. So anyway, so yeah. let's fix that. So we can find the BMR. The DCI, daily caloric intake, is how we fix this because we do move around. If you were to graph it, a lot of our calories, this green area, are from the BMR. And the yellow one is digesting food, actually takes a bunch of energy. And our physical activity is, for most people, about 15%. If you're very athletic, it would be more than that. 
If you're a couch potato, it would be less. But this is sort of a typical person in this picture. Um, the BMR doesn't include the thermic effect of food, so we have to make it bigger for both those reasons. So we're just going to multiply it by something. This fancy DCI formula basically is just saying, take your BMR and make it bigger by multiplying. If we multiply by a number that's bigger than one, it gets bigger. Right? If you multiplied it by two, it would double. So it turns out we don't want to double it. We want to multiply it by something that is bigger than one, but usually not all the way up to two. And the World Health Organization, a group that's in the news all the time today, um, has done some experiments and figured out that just sort of good enough for a normal person at the doctor office, we can just ask you, are you a couch potato, a normal person, or you have some sort of exercise routine? And then based on that, depending on if you're a woman or a man, we'll give you a number that's your multiplier. So let's do that with our two people. So Arthur, we hadn't paid any attention before to the fact that he was moderately active, but now that's going to come in. So he is moderately active. So for the DCI for Arthur, we're going to take that 1426 and the number for a moderately active man is 1.78. Everyone see how I'm using my table? I'll or type something if you're not. Yes. So 1426 times 1.78. So he's about 2,538. It's still calories per day, but this is calories per day of the Arthur that actually is not in bed all the time. Okay, Odette is very active. So her DCI, we're gonna take that 1,444. We're going to find the number for the very active woman. Okay, what's her number? One point eight two. One point eight two. Everyone see where that is? Yes. Very active. Okay, so whatever that is, one four four. So twenty six twenty eight. So that's not bad. There's a fair amount of writing on the board. I had a pretty lengthy formula where I had to plug in three different things. I had one of the things required some fidgeting before I plugged it in. And at the end, I had to multiply it by some number from a table. So there's a lot of steps here. This is something that you should practice just because Nothing individually is too hard, but there's just a lot of steps. It's easy to mess up somewhere along the way. So like any skill, if you do a little homework, you will get reliable and not make silly mistakes. But all we're doing is some basic adding and multiplying and plugging things into formulas. Okay, questions, comments, anything like that? This is great. Okay. So one word is that do 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 do. Do I say it over here? Yes. So this is accurate to about 10%. So if you're wondering how much do I round, then we could have rounded more. So 10% of this amount is 253, maybe 254. So Arthur's actual DCI could be as high as 2,700. 
or it could be as low as 2,200. Again, we're not covering him with stickers. This is just an estimate. It's the best we can do, but we can do it in a math class or a doctor's office, so that's pretty handy. So if I wanted to round this to 2540, I am more than justified in being that sloppy. We really don't know it to the single calorie per day at all. I do and have a question. Uh, sure. Um, so when I was, I took the, the five foot one on here and I just typed in 5.1 times 12. Is that what we're, we're not supposed to do that? No, nope, that doesn't work. I thought it was. I thought it was kind of weird when I did it too. If there's like something, so I was like, was like something foot. isn't right here. <laughs> yeah, if there's ten inches in a foot, that would work. But there's twelve right. inches in a foot. So exactly. It's I was like, decimal. something's not right. All right, thank you. Good question. Common. So question. I have a question. Sure. So I did it exactly how you did it. Um, mm -hmm. Mine looks exactly like yours, except the answer I got was not one thousand four hundred forty-four. Okay, well let's try it because I might have hit something wrong on the calculator. So 110 times 4.55 plus 61 times 15.88 minus 30 times 5 plus 5. Ah, 1324? Yes. Aha. Okay, so I hit something wrong on the calculator. That happens. Let me fix it. Thank you for catching me. Ne speak up sooner next time. Yeah. <laughs> I tried to say something stupid. Okay, 1324. I make stupid calculator mistakes too. That's what I got too, and I thought I got it wrong. <laughs> Me too. Okay, there we go. Everyone happy? Yeah. Yay, okay. probably should be like checking these. Oh, okay. There was that one. There was that one. Okay, use the calories. Okay, sorry about that. So where were we? Oh, rounding. Yeah, so we're not sure. She could be off by 240 from this number. We're only estimating, but that's the best we can do at the doctor's office without covering her with stickers. So. It's also true that when you're finding patterns on real people, it matters who the people are. So if you want to see, there's a whole list of other BMR formulas and there's better ones if you're a young Hispanic woman or an Asian woman, then their metabolisms are just a little different. So there's different patterns, so there's different formulas. So if you care about that, go there. But this is a math class. We just need one set of things to do homework problems and test problems on. So these are the ones that work the most. Okay, tangents. Exercising more seldom leads to weight loss. There's something that's well documented that if I, as a normal person, just decide to go jog an extra mile a day, I'm gonna get extra hungry and I will eat as many more calories as I burn. So for very few people, can you just exercise a little more and lose weight? You have to change both your exercise and your diet. It's also true that there is a myth in some of the weightlifting community that if you do some strenuous exercise, your whole metabolism will get boosted for hours and you'll just burn more calories and lose weight because you did lots of reps with your dumbbells or barbells or something. And that's for most people not true. The amount that strenuous exercise boosts your metabolism is just very short term. Your metabolism goes back to normal pretty quickly. However, if you are over 50 and you do both resistance and aerobic exercise, so some stuff with weights and aerobic, then your basal metabolic rate can be as much as 30% higher than your peers. So if you have older relatives, then encourage them do both aerobic and a little bit of either body weight or weight bearing exercise. And it can really help as you get older. It's also true, I don't know where I put the comment, that none of this works for professional athletes. If you've heard 
stories of like marathon runners that can't get pregnant because their body just totally changes and says, we're in super exercise mode, that's all we're gonna do, then yeah, if you are a professional athlete, these patterns don't work for you at all. The formulas don't apply. Okay, last formula. The body mass index, or BMI, is a formula that is used terribly in society. So we're studying this one because we have to, not because we want to. So the BMR and DCI are personal measurements. They were about patterns of individual people. And as much as a pattern can be accurate, they are, right? 10% is pretty good for this kind of thing. The BMI is a different one. So we're gonna take your weight and divide it by 2.2. We're gonna take your height and divide it by 39.37. We're gonna square the height part, and then we're going to do the weight divided by that square. And this time the parentheses do matter because we're only having division and squares happening. So the BMI was a pattern and it was finding patterns of whether or not people were obese based on populations. It was never intended to be something that measured a person. It was about a group measurement. It ignores how much your body weight is muscle versus fat. It ignores healthy issues of if you're apple shaped versus pear shaped. And our federal government says, yeah, BMI isn't a diagnostic of the body fatness or health of an individual, but it's still used that way. If you go to the doctor's office, you will see on their computer screen your BMI. And sometimes you have a health insurance policy where each year you have to do something, fill out some paperwork and they will do your DC, your BMI. So it is claimed that a healthy BMI is between 18.5 and 25, but that's again, using something that's a group measurement per individual. So we're doing this partly because it's a common health formula and we're in a math class. So, hey, a formula, but also so you can have heard about this. And if you seem to be a very healthy person by every measurement, except your BMI, then don't worry about it. Of course, I'm a math teacher, not a doctor. So don't take my medical advice, but there we go. Okay, on the other hand, if your BMI changes a lot, if when you're 20, it's this, and 21 is about the same, and 22 is about the same, and when you're 23, it's suddenly much different, then that change could be alarming. But in general, don't worry about it too much. Okay, percent body fat is trying to see if your weight is healthy. The American Council on Exercise has made some categories for you. Are you sort of scary, crazy abs? You need more fat, you're not healthy. Are you an athlete? You have well-defined abs. Are you fit? I can almost see your abs or slightly see your abs. An average person, you have love handles. Or are you obese? You're just kind of squishy. So we're not going to worry about that too much because there's no formula and we like formulas. But in general, if you're worried about how much body fat do I have, don't look at the body mass index formula. Instead, just sort of look at your love handles and see which picture looks like you. And ta-da, there you go. And as a concluding thing, there's the saying, nothing tastes as good as feeling fit. So if that is true for you, that you like how your abdomen feels, exercising seems just as good as eating a cookie, then you are in good shape. Don't worry about your body fat. Okay. Um, doo -doo -doo. That's a good stopping point for this. Okay, questions about all of those health measurements? No. no. Let me go back and look at topics. So these, again, are straightforward formulas. They might be kind of long. They might have that tricky thing with feet and inches, but we're just plugging things in the formulas. So that's our theme for health, health decisions and we're gonna keep going with that. Okay, food preparation. Imagine that a friend with a garden gives me some wonderful carrots and I want to make a family dinner. And what do I do that uses a dozen carrots? So, ta-da, I can do that. I can start with a pile of carrots 
and work my way down to a recipe. But that's because I am spoiled and at home in my kitchen. If you're in a professional kitchen, everything is more complicated. You want to make the right recipes and you have to shop for the food based on the recipes. You can't have the luxury of making a recipe based on your food. Everyone okay with my difference there? And the danger is that when we go shopping, we won't get enough. If I need a bunch of carrots for a certain recipe, then by the time I trim all the carrots, there's less than what I shopped for. If I shopped for 20 pounds of carrots, by the time I clean them and make them nice, there's a lot less than 20 pounds of carrots. So we want to make sure that we buy extra so that after we clean our vegetables, we have enough. So when we scale recipes, there's going to be a complication. There's some of it that's just basic math of I want twice as much, so I make everything times two. But there's also that with produce, we have to pay attention to shopping. So that's our overview, the overture. Let's see what happens. When the numbers are friendly, it's easy to scale a recipe. If we want a triple batch, we can multiply every amount by three. If we want a half batch, then, whoops, that should say divide. Don't trust that word. We divide everything by two. But usually the numbers are not convenient. We might say that you need 1.5 cups of sugar for 12 servings, and we want 200 servings, but 12 isn't a factor of 200. So we can't just say times some nice whole number. We have to do a little bit more complicated math. So this is about ratios and rates. And again, just like at the beginning of class, we're going to jump back to math 20 to do some review, and then we'll come back here and see our application for math 25. And as before, I've sort of put a bare amount of review in the math 25 notes. If you need more review, go back to the math 20. So where this is in the math 20 is right here in ratios and rates. So go there if that helps you. So shape-shifting topic, ratios and rates. But I'm going to use, I think, just the part that's in our Math 25 notes this time. So a ratio is when I am comparing two things and writing them like a fraction. So if I have 1.5 cups of sugar, For 12 servings, in a way that's not a fraction. I'm used to thinking of fractions like parts of a pie. Oh, that's an absolutely terrible circle. Uh, let's try this again. There we go. Oh, okay. So my favorite fractions are something like this. where the top number is how many parts I care about, and the bottom number is how many parts there are total. That sort of makes the most sense as a fraction. I have three out of four. But what we just saw wasn't like that at all. The cups and servings are different things. It's apples and oranges. It's not like I have so many parts out of so many whole. So I can write it like a fraction, I can use it like a fraction, but it's not quite a fraction. That's why we're calling it something else. The ratios that had labels are rates. So these ones are rates as well as ratios, because they have words on them. And I encourage you, everything we do in Math 25, put the words, it will just keep you safer, and we'll talk about that. A proportion is an equation that has ratio equals ratio, or rate equals rate. So if we want to scale this up for 200 servings, remove that over. I 
could write that kind of thing, which might look familiar from math 20. I could cross multiply and solve for y. So proportion is if there's only an equal sign connecting two rates. If I put anything else like a one plus in front, that's not a proportion anymore, but we won't ever do that. Okay, that's my vocab. Let's go back to the lecture. So if you were in my math 20 class last term, you've seen exactly the same thing, but it's really worth doing again. So I am going to do it again. Here are four different situations. Some pretend math students have tried to write proportions describing these four things. Sometimes they did a good job. Sometimes they didn't. So for number one, which of these four are good proportions and which ones are broken and don't work? Um, can I reply to the text to everyone? I think so. The bookstore has a packet for Math 25. We don't use it. Return it and get your money back. So, yeah. There's a way to teach the class badly without my nice website, and that's what the packet was for. So, but when I teach it, the packet's obsolete. Okay, um, anyway, does red work? Types things, thumbs up, um, something like that. I like the black one. You like which one? Last one in the first row. The last one, this one here. Does that, that work? Does that work? We can test it with cross multiplying. Is 40 times one the same as 80 times two? No, so that one's not gonna work actually. If people are shy about calling out because of the recording, I'm happy to pause the recording. We're almost all here. Let's try the second one in the second row, or the first row, excuse me. First row, yeah, stay with the first the row one blue. at a time. So 40 times two, is that the same as 80 times one? Yes. Yeah, so this one works, we like this one. How about the red one or the green one? The red one's correct. Um, the red one, the red one's nice. 40 times two is 80 times one. Green's wrong. Green is wrong. 40 times 80 is huge. Two times one is different. Right? So there must be an easier way to do this than actually cross multiply for every time. So what we will notice is that in the ones that work well, I have two situations. Actually, let me do this on a new slide. So I have 40 miles in an hour, and I'm going to make that an arrow, miles and then hour. And I have 80 miles in two hours. And if I look for where things are, 40 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour. 40 miles, one hour, 80 miles, two hours, 80 miles, two hours, 80 miles, two hours, 80 miles, two hours. The ones that work well, the first two in this case, the arrows were parallel. You could have one situation on the right and one on the left. For most people, this is the most natural thing. Let's have one situation on the right and one on the left. You could have one situation on the top and one on the bottom. Some people prefer that. What you can't do is have one going down and one going up. 
nor, like in Ghostbusters, can you cross beams. That's bad. <laughs> so I don't need to actually cross multiply. If I want to check if these work, I can just look for that pattern. So 220 for a pound. Um, whoops, by the way. $11 for five pounds. So 11 for five, 11 for five, 11 for five, 11 for five. 220 for one, 220 for one, 220 for one, 220 for one. So the ones that are going to work are going to be the ones that have the parallel situations And I could do all the cross multiplying, but I don't need to. I know that this isn't going to work because the arrows are the wrong way. I know this isn't going to work because I've crossed beams. So the moral of the story is when we are making proportions, instead of just looking at proportions somebody else made, we should do it the right way. We should have one situation on one side, the other situation on the other side, if it's miles on top, it stays miles on top. If it's hours on bottom, it stays hours on bottom. Whatever the words are, have to match. And if we do that, it will be good. If we don't, it might be bad. And there might be someone who says, eh, my brain doesn't like this. I want the one where one situation is on top and one is on bottom. And so yes, do that. But this is sort of a don't ask, don't tell thing. I'm going to always do it this way because for almost everyone, this is the clear way to do things. If I try to do this while lecturing, I'm going to mess up and confuse lots of people. Or I do it right and I confuse lots of people. So if you like the one situation on top and one on bottom, always do it that way. Your brain works that way. Great. I just don't have the luxury in class of doing it your way. So, okay, where were we? We're going to actually do some Math 25 stuff. So let's do that one we did before. 1.5 cups of sugar, 12 servings. We want to shop for 200 servings. That's going to be too wide unless I shrink it first. How many cups of sugar do I use? So I'll start by writing something. I'm gonna read along. A recipe, yeah, 1.5 cups. I see that, so I write it. Cups of sugar for 12 servings. Okay, that's one situation. I put it on one side. Again, if you like it on top, that's your business. And at this point, I stop reading the word problem. I don't care about the rest of the word problem. I know from what we just did, that I have to have symmetry. So I'm going to make my fraction and there's gonna be cups on the top and servings on the bottom. And now I am safe. Only after that do I keep reading. Your restaurant wants to shop for 200 servings. So that goes here. How many cups of sugar? Ta-da! Everyone see what I did so that I didn't mess up. If I put servings on top and cups on the bottom for the other situation, then I would be crossing beams and bad things would happen. Yeah, I'm sorry about the bookstore packet. It doesn't matter how many times I email the bookstore, they still don't change things. Okay, how do we solve the proportions? We do this cross multiplying thing. Can you read the yellow? I haven't written in yellow before. Yes. Yes, okay. Okay, now if you have been in my Math 20 class, you know what's coming. I have to talk a lot. So when I'm solving this proportion, when I'm cross multiplying, does it matter 
which diagonal I put on the left and which diagonal I put on the right. No, they're going to be equal. When things are equal, it doesn't matter which one I rate first. Within each diagonal, does it matter whether I put the y or the 12 left or right when I'm multiplying? When I multiply two things, does it matter which comes first? No. No, right? Two times three, three times two, it doesn't matter. So I always have the power to say, I'm going to pick the diagonal with the letter and write it on the left side. And I'm always going to take the letter and put it very first. I just like my cross multiplying lines to always say y times something equals something. To me, it's nice and consistent. Everything is happy. That's what my brain likes. So if your brain works like mine, then feel free to always do that. Pick the diagonal with the y and pick the y, start with that. That's within our power. Okay, so y times 12 equals 300. Then I divide both sides by 12 to get y by itself. And, whoops, I said 300, but I wrote 30. And yes, 25. Okay, I just did a whole bunch of math 20 that we haven't officially reviewed yet. So is there anyone that needs to talk about any of this stuff here on the page? No, you could always do a wave hand or something like that if you want. Oh, we're good? Okay. Okay, yes, Elizabeth, what? You're good, okay. I'm gonna talk more, even if you don't want me to. So, if you are going into math 60, this step right here is really important. And I'm gonna show you why, even though not everyone is going into math 60. If we have um, y over four is, and over 20. Here's an easy one. Maybe you can even just look at it and solve it. If I'm multiplying, I have my y times 20 on one side and my 4 times 10 on the other. Everyone's happy with that, right? If I changed things, what if instead of y over 4, it was y plus 1 over 4? Because now we're in math 60 and might do that then I would have y plus one as a quantity times 20 and four times 10, We're still cross multiplying. And there's two ways to go from here. I could say that let's take the 20 and divide by 20 on both sides. Or I could take the same thing and say, let's do what's called distributing. And we'll get the 20 times the y and the 20 times the one and proceed down that path. And for both of these, I'm not done. I have to keep going with the problem. But my point is that the path forks. Everyone following at least a little bit, even if you don't care about Math 60? So there is a shortcut. When you see a problem like whatever we had, 1.5 over 12 equals y over 200, there's a nice shortcut you may have learned where first you take the, 
two numbers diagonally opposite each other and you multiply them. And then you take the odd one out and you divide. Whoops, that's not pencil. Okay. Okay, has everyone seen that shortcut before? Yep. If you haven't, then like raise your hand or let me know or say something or something. Um, okay, so good shortcut. Multiply the ones that have a diagonal, divide by the other one that's opposite the Y. So if math 25 is your last math class, this is a great shortcut. There's nothing wrong with this shortcut. You don't have to write everything I did over here. On the other hand, this shortcut is saying, I'm going to multiply those two and divide by that. So that's the multiply by these two and divide by that. That's this path. I'm dividing by the 20 right away, rather than doing something else with the 20. And in math 60 problems, sometimes this path is the easy path. Sometimes this path is the easy path. If you pick the wrong path in a more complicated problem, you get a lot more work. So if you are going on to Math 60, don't use the shortcut. Practice your good habit of always writing this step so you can look at it and say, what's the right path to go after I cross multiply? On the other hand, nobody needs to write this line and that line. If you leave out my stuff in blue, I can still tell what's happening. I can see what you did. You divided by 12 on both sides. If you leave out what I do in black and just go straight from the colorful line, divide both sides by 12, I can also see what you do. So you don't have to write both of those middle lines. If you write just one of them, none of them, and go all the way from this line to this line, then it's like, I'm not sure what you did. I can't follow you. You're doing too much in your head. So you don't have to write both of those lines. But if you're going into Math 60, definitely write this line and then pick your favorite of these two lines. Or write them both if you want. If you're not going into Math 60, welcome to the world of the shortcut. You can write a lot less. But I don't want anyone having their Math 60 teacher yelling at me that they're always doing this because of the stupid shortcut in Math 60. I never okay. understood why it matters if you come up with the right answer. <laughs> yeah, because once the problems get bigger, the process matters. Because sometimes you want to do that, and sometimes you don't. Do oh. uh, do 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 do. Should we do more? We only have a few minutes. Sure, this is quick. The same thing we just did for scaling the ingredients in the recipe, like how many cups of sugar to use, we can also use for changing units of measurement. So if I want to do, oh, I can't do it that way. This problem. Then if you're good at this, you can just say, ah, oh, one pound is 16 ounces. And I take my 1,313 and I know what to do. Do I divide by 16 or do I multiply by 16? Divide. We get about 82. That's nice and efficient. The issue is sometimes we're not good at this, especially on a test because tests tend to make our brains freeze. So if I'm not trusting myself, do I multiply or do I divide? Then I can always do this the long way as a proportion. One of the two situations is my generic conversion rate. One pound 
is 16 ounces. And then just like before, I immediately stop, make my labels happen on the other side. Then I say, ah, the other situation is what I have in my problem. 1,313 ounces is how many pounds? Now I have a proportion. I will do Y times 16 is one times 1,313. Divide both sides by 16. You definitely explain these proportions a lot better than my uh, Mass 20 teacher did. Uh, I'm glad. Okay, so the bottom is the long way. I wrote more. But on the other hand, the bottom is completely fail safe. By using this trick of making the labels match, which I can't mess up even on a test when my brain shuts down, then it tells me I'm dividing by 16. I don't have to think, am I dividing or am I multiplying? So based on our personal backgrounds, there's always some things that were very good at this and some things were not. If you do a lot in the kitchen, dividing by 16 might be just second nature. I can do that in my sleep. If you're a carpenter, doing all the stuff with feet and inches is really easy and so on. But if, every, if you ever come to something that's a measurement conversion and it's not second nature to you, especially on a test, just write out the proportion. It still only takes a short amount of time and you can't go wrong. For most chat. people at LCC, the ones you have to measure well, ones you have to memorize, or if not memorize, put in your notes where they're really convenient, because we'll use them a lot this section, is that there's eight ounces in a cup, two cups in a pint, two pints in a quart, and four quarts in a gallon. And how do you remember that? So here's our picture of a gallon. And the first thing that people had historically was quarts. So a quarts are a quarter of a gallon. That's why they're called quarts. Each of these quarts So one um, No, I'm doing this wrong. Never mind, not quite yet. One then you chop them in half and you get pints. So the pints is the one I wanted. So each of these pints is 16 ounces, just like how one pound is 16 ounces. Those are kind of the 16s that people liked in Europe at the time. Cups wasn't historically a measurement unit for volume. If somebody said, add a cup of flour to your recipe, you would just take whatever cup you happen to have next to you and scoop a cup of flour and that was good enough. It wasn't considered a precise thing like pints and quarts. So that's why the 16 goes with pints instead of with cups, because that cups were sort of not around yet. Then you take the pint, cut them in half again, you get the cups. So I can draw all of that in this one nice picture where the whole thing is the gallon. There's my quarter, the quart, the eighths is the pint, and the cups is the 16th. And you can see if you draw this on your notes somewhere convenient that, oh yeah, 16 cups per gallon, we're good. Silly story. Do you ever wonder why people say mind your P's and Q's? Well, pubs in England used to give you credit, right? So can I pick on Crystal? So Crystal goes to the pub and she's drinking, but payday is until Friday. So the bartender on the bar behind on the board marks P's and Q's by her name. And so when we say mind your P's and Q's, that means don't rack up too much of a bar bill. But these days we just say it to little kids, which is kind of silly. As a local tangent, because we're in the grass seed capital of the world, a dry court is something different. If your family is in the grass seed business, you know all about dry courts. We don't care. Too confusing for Math 25. 
Okay, there are three minutes left. Let's look at homework. So, actually first let's go back and look at topics. We're still only in health decisions. We've done all of patterns and today no one had questions on patterns. So patterns will be due when I see you next. I'll send you the reminder in the email. Calories we finished today, no due date yet. Metabolism we finished today, no due date yet. Food prep, if you want to rush ahead because it's the weekend and you actually have time or something, you can, but we're not done with food prep yet. So I'm not expecting anyone to turn in a food prep homework, but maybe you will. As always, our lecture notes are here. Can you see that at the bottom or is it hidden by my Zoom controls on your screen? Can you see the whole row I'm highlighting? Yes. Yes, okay, I'm glad my Zoom controls aren't in your way. And so if you're missing things, go there. Okay, homework. So go back and look at the math topics. Try and do the example problems we just did for the last hour and a half. Make sure you can do them when I'm not here. If you want to do more things with proportions or percents, you can always use the free online textbook and do some review problems there. Just look up proportions and things like that, but I'm not expecting anyone to do that. Problem bank, no. Nope. Your job again as Math 25 students is if there's problems you want me to do a short two or three minute video of, do that and I'll add them to the problem bank. But as of now, we have no problem bank. That's for the Math 25. Random problems. Once I've looked at my notes, what I really expect you to do is to go here and try some pattern ones, try some calories, try some metabolism, and maybe even try some food prep. You can tell which ones we've done and which ones we haven't. So do a bunch of those, get good at the random problems. Then turn in homework. So for health decisions, before next class, try and do the 10 ones for patterns. Again, the link at the very bottom says, I'm gonna turn them in here. Send me that code. If you have time, we've done calories. So try these 10 problems. And metabolism, if you have time, try those 10 problems. And if you want, because you're a crazy person and have a weekend, you can do the food prep. But again, we're not done with food prep, so I'm not expecting this of anyone. Looking at our calendar, Then if you need more study sessions or office hours, let me know. But tomorrow at 3.30, I will be here in the Zoom room. Feel free to come and with each other or with me work on problems. If you want more time, if you want something over the weekend, let me know. But maybe I will see you Friday and then we'll have our next class on Tuesday. Uh, Monday, study session on Monday after my Math 20 class. They're not showing up to it yet. You can steal it, it can be your study session. Okay, anything before I say goodbye? No, okay. I will stop my screen share. I will stop the recording. Have a good weekend.